Christ is risen. Risen indeed. Christ is risen. Risen indeed. Now, after he rose early on the first day of the week, he appeared first to Mary Magdalene, from whom he had cast out seven demons. She went and told those who had been with him while they were still mourning and weeping. But when they heard that he was alive and had been seen by her, they disbelieved it. After this, he appeared in another form to two of them as they were, as they were walking into the countryside. And they went back and told the rest, but they disbelieved them. Later, he appeared to the eleven themselves as they were reclining to eat together. And he rebuked them for their lack of faith and for their hardness of heart. Their hardness of heart. Because they had not believed those who saw him after he had risen. And he said to them, go into all the world, proclaim the good news to every creature. The one who trusts and is baptised will be saved. But the one who does not trust you will be condemned. And signs like these will accompany and authenticate those who trust. They will speak in new tongues, in new languages. They will pick up snakes. And if they drink any deadly thing, it will not hurt them. They will lay their hands on the sick and they will recover. So then the Lord Jesus, after he had spoken to them, was taken up into the sky, into heaven, and sat down at the right hand of God. And they went out and proclaimed the good news everywhere. And the Lord worked with them and confirmed their message by signs that accompanied it. What are we here for? For this. Good news to all creation, good news to every creature. That is what you are here for. Good news. But almost no one else in the mainstream churches today will put it that way. Good news. Every creature, the birds need good news too. That's the Easter message. It's not being messed around with or tweaked by some tree hugger, except for the one who had no choice but to hug a tree because he was nailed to it. The one who, when crucifiers wanted to mock him, was invested with the regalia of creation. Thorns as the sharp-sided jewels of that crown. The reed as the scepter. Good news to all creation is, of course, also good news to us. And we can pursue it. We can live it. We can proclaim it. Are we not creatures amongst creatures? Are we not flesh amongst flesh? And right here and now today, beside the empty tomb or in the graveyard that gave birth to our faith out of the womb of the earth, we need to take notice. We need to trust and trusting change. Just as Jesus raised up on the cross, promised to draw together everything, of course, including us, but not just us. It's very unlikely that in your church this Easter Sunday, you will have heard that part of Mark's account because it's scary. And like the disciples who are described in Mark's gospel up to the point at which we joined it, we live with a, a desperate fear. Now there's plenty in a time of crisis to be feared of, though our church's fear is misplaced. It's the fear of what we read in this Easter account, which is so scarily untamed that respectable Christians have been grateful for the excuse which is offered with integrity by biblical study to disregard Mark's inclusive commission of the risen Christ to the church of God's love for the wholeness of the world for which God's self in Christ is given. We live with this insistence on ignoring and setting aside this inclusive great commission of the risen Christ while delighting in the similar one in Matthew because it seems safe, because it's just about discipleship. With regard to the origins and processes 
of how Mark's Gospel got into writing. We ignore it because, with fair certainty, a different member of the originating community of the earliest written Gospel put Quill to Papyrus a few years later, just to give us the final half of the end of Mark's Gospel, in a time when people had begun to move on from those first-generation memories. We are the first generation that has the warning, that has the, the good news which tells us of the bad news. Are we going to take notice? This part of Mark is full of untamed language. It's the sort of thing that I've heard, and I won't drop them in it, certain lecturers say is too scary for us to be bothered with today. Of course it's scary. The world is scary, our situation is scary, the climate crisis is very scary indeed. This is what we need to hear and urgently ponder on. Christ is risen and calls disciples out of love for all the participants of the Rainbow Covenant, for all flesh. That's what the word became, all that has breath, all who dwell on earth, the hand-clapping trees, the the dancing mountains, the roaring seas, the air full of birds, the monsters of the deep seas. The injustice we inflict on each other as humans is dwarfed by the injustice we do to life and to land. But Marx's incorrigibly activist hands-on gospel does not limit its scope to cosy stewardship of the inanimate property of an absentee landlord god. With the Easter that I grew up with, at the resurrection, all is well. We can rest. Maybe that's because clergy and priests and ministers and pastors have absolutely worn themselves out by the time you get to Easter Sunday morning. It feels like all is well. We can breathe easy. But the new life is the hope we're given because the world is too scary just now not to hope. And this is authenticated in Mark's Gospel by a quintet of signs that comfortable Christians have preferred to run a mile from. Recycled speech, disaster for disbelief. Handling snakes, hands-on healing, drinking poison. Since lockdown, we've faced up as seldom before to the fear of new languages. We've learnt the brutal lesson that in a crisis, you either speak in tongues or you face being silenced or you hide behind that sectarian jibe that online modes of worship are never real and thereby spurn the psalmist's call to sing a new song to the Lord. There's tragically good reason though for some of these fears. We live to start with with a desperate fear of judgmentalism. So hackles rise when we hear these words, those who do not trust will be condemned. Ah! No one, and I hope that includes you, wants to be a smug, judgmental Bible basher. If you hear the word sin, remember, we're talking about real harm being done. This condemnation does not reflect the trivial, peevish anger of some pie-in-the-sky God who doesn't like the way you do your hair. We heard how the disciples themselves were hard-hearted. They wouldn't shift even when they had good reason to trust on the basis of what their friends had seen. It wasn't that they couldn't trust, they actively distrusted. Judgmentalism is a total trivialization of the good news of the risen Christ. Yes, that life is scary, too scary to live without the hope that resides in the message of the risen Christ, which again is take notice, trust. If you don't trust warnings given in love, are you not condemned? Trust implies you put things into practice. Choosing not to trust and not to act on what you do trust, that puts the world in harm's way. The gospel is good news because it is the warning we need to hear. Take or leave it at your own peril, but also at the peril of the common home we share.
And then taking up snakes. The snakes come in other parts of the Bible. Snakes raised up like Christ said he was to be raised up on the cross because a sign of healing, a sign of wisdom. And certainly Jesus tells us, and we've had so much fun with this, that disciples should be gentle as doves, but crafty as snakes. Can we embrace the craftiness? Because we're going to need everything at our disposal to shift not just our own hard hearts, but those of everyone around us who do not yet trust in their hearts the warnings that we are given, the warnings we are living with, which are in themselves God-given, the voice of the earth crying out, interpreted by science. We are trying. Like the disciples in that story, we are trying God's patience. There's so much we need to retrieve from the half-hearted, untrusting, disbelieving, wishy-washy version of Christian character that we've probably grown up with, that niceness training to keep the children in order so they never say no. As doves, yes, but also as snakes. Let's show that Christ is risen. What's more healing than a simple longed-for hug in lockdown? Yet abuses and ego trips obscure the beauty of getting involved hands-on in healing. It's community, community alone that offers this context, because it's they, it's they, not just he or she, who will get healing's hands dirty in so many ways, in protest, in, in prayer, in action, in cleaning beaches, in litter-picking streets, feeding the hungry, caring for wildlife, healing the planet and the sickness of deadly injustice. And yes, in complementary partnership with medicine too. There is no conflict. In crisis, should we not be more scared of not getting involved? Drinking poison. Of course, there's plenty of things about the Bible that don't yet ring bells to you, that do not mean what they might yet mean. For we speak with holy reverence about drinking blood. That is when someone hasn't dashed in and tried to water down the wine of Christ's words. But here, bear with me. I hope you didn't expect me to settle or finally sort out the gospel. All I can offer is a snapshot on the hoof of what life has made meaningful to me. Wouldn't it be far scarier if I had solved and sorted out for good the words of Christ? Don't worry about that. There is a rule for crisis reading of scripture. When the time comes that you hear something, that it means something because it chimes with the experience of the world that you're living with, then the Spirit speaks recycling, repurposing those ancient written texts. That's what inspiration means. That shows that Christ is risen for us today. Risen indeed. Hallelujah. Amen. <laughs>